And that's where they hatched their plans. And the BIS published papers that tell you know, which direction we're going with things like central bank digital currency. And the guy you just saw, Augustin Carsons, is the head of the BIS. He's the general manager. And you're right. It was totally technocratic, like that expression of central bank liability. What he means is it's digital cash. We know every, every penny is, and we can control it every yeah. penny. Welcome back to Wall Street Silver. We have a great guest today, Mr. John Titus. John Titus is a YouTuber with a great channel called Best Evidence. And th thank you for joining us, John. Thanks for having me. First time. Glad to be here. So, you know, what What I found you, John, um, from a great video you recently did. Uh, and you were explaining, uh, it, it was uh, Larry, Larry and Karsten's Excellent Pandemic was the title. And I'll put the link in the description for people if they want to watch the full video. But you did a great explanation of, let's call it the, the, the retail circuit of money versus the commercial bank circuit of money. Right. And how reserves are in the system. And I, I use the term how they leak out of the system. Maybe there's a better term. Um, but you really sort of explained this. And, and other guys... You know, uh, other guests we've had, they, they make the argument that, uh, you know, federal reserve, the reserves that they exchange with, that the Fed exchanges with commercial banks, they don't ever leak out of the system. And you walk through uh, how that's really not quite accurate. And I'd, I'd like to dive into that deep, uh, more deeply today. Sure. Um, let me just start by saying the, the whole notion of reserves as money in the system is an enormous source of confusion. And that is not accidental. That confusion uh, works to the advantage of the Federal Reserve, which is more than happy to perpetuate that confusion by putting people like Bill Dudley, former head of the New York Fed on Bloomberg TV or wherever, to say, oh, well, reserves, you know, never cause a problem because they won't leak out of the system, which is an enormous half-truth. Um, the part that's true is res the reserves are in a circuit that includes the Federal Reserve as a source of the money in the circuit, the source of the reserves. So that's the side on the left side, the public, the wholesale uh, Correct. Circuit. That would be the, that blue there. That's the wholesale circuit. The Federal Reserve is the source of money in that circuit. And the users in that circuit, and I show there commercial banks as users, and certainly they are a class of users. Other users in the wholesale circuit include the U.S. government, particularly, and most importantly, the Treasury, and also other central banks use reserves in that circuit. And the reserves stay in that circuit. The people who aren't in that circuit are like the three of us. Mm -hmm. We're not in there. Ordinary businesses aren't in there. Mom and pop businesses aren't there. Even financial businesses that aren't commercial banks aren't in there. Insurance companies aren't in there. Hedge funds aren't in there. We all use, we're all in the other circuit, in yeah. the red circuit. That's the retail circuit. But back to the reserves, those reserves, they're exactly right. Those reserves don't leak out. However, if you look at that diagram, you notice that the commercial banks are users of money in one, cir works, one circuit, the wholesale circuit, but they're providers of money in the other circuit, in our circuit, the retail circuit. The source of electronic money in our circuit is, is commercial banks. They lend money into existence. When they lend money, they don't go to that vault behind you and get their money. They create it out of thin air. And they lend it into existence. And so the big lie is that, well, the reserves don't really leak out. But that's that's not really that, that's not really the question. The question is, d does the creation of new reserves have some influence on the retail banking circuit? And in particular, do they have an influence on the creation of bank money in the retail circuit? And the answer to that, as we've seen since the beginning of 2020, is most certainly yes. It all depends on what the Fed does with the reserves that it creates. Others have argued, well, if the banks aren't lending nothing happened. Is that accurate then? The only way for that to, for anything to grow on the outside is banks have to be lending yeah. based on their reserves. Well, they don't need reserves to lend. All right. For they, they, you just saw the reserve, the federal reserve cut the reserve requirement to zero and they're still lending. Right. Okay. That's, that's an enormous, that's another big kind of a fiction and it's put out there to confuse people. 
banks lend first and then they get the reserve requirement. If there is a reserve requirement, they satisfy that later. There's been a, there was a paper by a guy named Professor Richard Verner, and he shows in the paper the banks they create the money first, and then they don't even check their reserves when they when they make the loan. They just go ahead and create the money out of nothing and they lend it. Uh, that's what that's what creates the bank money, and that's what is the source of the loan. And only later do they ask if they've met the reserve requirement. So okay. the, they've got the tail they've got the tail wagging the dog. So they, they have to make like once a quarter, they have to be in line with reserve requirements or something yeah, like that? Maybe it was once a week. I don't know what it was. Okay. But the point is it's lending first and it's checked with the reserve requirement later. Okay. And if you, if you need more reserves, the Fed's going to accommodate you. The Fed's been accommodating the commercial banks for a very, very long time. This is very clear in a chapter, chapter four of a book by a guy named Joseph Huber called Sovereign Money. He lays it all out there, the two circuits, and he makes it clear that the bank money is created first and the reserve requirement, <clears throat> if it's applicable, they, they decide whether they need to worry about that later. Now, is, where's the scam part of this? Now, you, 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 you referred as this is some sort of fictional scam. Yeah. Um, walk us through that. The, the, the scam is that in 2020, that the Fed created three and a half trillion dollars of reserves and added it to its balance sheet and that it had no effect. It, you know, that, that by doing that, it had no effect on the retail banking circuit. And that's absolutely false. So I'm going to share this. Is this the graph you're referring to right now? Yeah, that's 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 the that's the no doubter right there. So what you can see in that graph, that's actually a great graph to have. You can see the two vertical gray bars. OK, the one on the left, the big fat gray bar, that's the 18 month recession surrounding the global financial crisis of 08, 09. OK. And then the skinny two month gray bar on the right is the uh, two months at the very beginning of the pandemic, say in February and March of, of 2020. Okay. okay. That, that's just sort of your goalpost there. We all know, because you can look at that graph, you can look at the blue line of deposits on account at the Fed, that's essentially reserves. You can see there's a big bump up in 2008, right? It, it explodes up in September, then it settles down a little bit, but it, it's up and it's up permanently. That is the Fed creating reserves out of nothing. Now, if you look down to the red line when that is going on, hardly any, there's hardly any effect whatsoever on the red line. The red line is deposit accounts in commercial banks. So it's your bank account plus my bank account, everybody, you know, everybody in the retail circuits bank account is added up and that's the red line. And you can see the red line is not really influenced hardly at all. Um, by yeah, the blue cool. line, even even during the explosion of QE during 08, 09, 2010, red line doesn't really even budge hardly at all. Yeah, that looked like about two trillion right there, uh, from from the eleven trillion handle up to about thirteen. This well, I, that's that's an offset that I've put on that on that graph. Uh -huh. um, the, if you actually looked at the graph itself, it would be down at zero. The offset doesn't matter. The point is to show whether there's a correlation. Okay. You can see that from the beginning of that graph, which starts in December of 2002, up until about you know, sometime toward the end of 19, beginning of 20, the blue line and the red line are at, they're totally independent. The red line absolutely does not flinch, no matter what the well, no matter what the reserves are doing. The retail banking money just it just it trucks along. It's a line and it stays. It's just linear. But then all of a sudden you could see that the Fed goes through another spasm of QE at the beginning of 2020, and suddenly the red line snaps to, and it begins tracking, begins tracking the blue line very tightly. This was the um, the repo crisis right here, right? Where the blue line changed direction in yes. September 2019? Bingo. That's it's around 9-11, 9-17, 2019. That is a New York repo crisis. Okay, and then they're like linked arm in arm, and this is yeah. the, vi the vi virus pandemic. Boom, three trillion dollars. Yep, uh, created retail deposits also jumped in. Uh, yep, in, in lockstep, and then we get to I guess January, February of this year, right, twenty twenty one, and now they're diverging again. What's what's happened here? What's happened when the blue line begins to dip back down there? is that the banks, the deposits that are on account of the Fed, which are being held predominantly by commercial banks, commercial banks are being induced at that point by the Fed to convert their deposits 
two reverse repos. Okay. And Stephen Van Meter has um has a video on that called the Fed's latest um I don't know trick or the Fed's latest scam something like that. I link to it in my video uh, that you're talking about, which is called Larry and Carson's Excellent Pandemic. And so, in other words, what the Fed is doing there is saying, hey, banks, you know, you guys got all this money on deposit at our at our bank at the Fed. Why don't we start paying you interest rates on re reverse repos in such a way that it induces the banks to convert deposits at the Fed to reverse repos? And Van Meter explains, he does a very good job explaining, that's the Fed's way of inducing, it, it's, it's tricking out the, the, the accounts at the Fed in order to gin up demand for treasuries. It's a, it's a really smart, it's in the, in the sense of clever move to prop up demand for U.S. treasuries. They were basically running independently. Now, all of a sudden, they're tracking together. Right. And the Fed must have changed their policy or something to have it spike. Yes. Reserve. So yes. can you get into that and explain sure. what happened? Uh, I have a video on that um, called QE. Quantitative easing is the greatest sham ever. And the, the, so the party line from the Fed is always, well, the, you know, we create res reserves, but they don't get into the stock market. We're not doing that to pump up the stock market. And that video says that's a total lie. That's exactly what you're doing. And the way you're doing it is as follows. You, you know, Fed, that commercial banks can't use, they, they use reserves and central governments, use, um, central banks use reserves. And, but ordinary people like you and me, we don't use reserves, right? We don't have an account of the Fed. If, if you gave us reserves, that, that's not going to do us any good. It's like giving us Chuck E. Cheese tokens. We can't take those tokens and invest them in the stock market. So what the Fed started doing in early 2020 and doing it big time, and I think they probably started in September 2019, but I know they started in 2020. What they started doing is they, they, they would use reserves. They create, say, a billion dollars of new reserves. And they take that billion dollars and they'd go to, say, like um, PIMCO, or they'd go to CalPERS this is a good example. They'd go to ret a retirement account and they'd say, hey, you know what? We noticed that you've got a treasury um, you're, you're invested in. It's a, it's a really, it's a dog. It doesn't have any yield at all. It's for a billion dollars. Wouldn't you like to sell that treasury? And, and CalPERS would be like, well, yeah, we, yeah, we would love, we'd love to sell it. It is a dog. It's yielding very low but we're not going to get a good price for it. There's no demand. So the Fed would say, I'll tell you what, tell you what, we'll buy it from you. And Cobbers is like, well, yeah, but we don't have a reserve account. We can't use reserves. What are we going to do with it? And the Fed would say, you know what, here's how we'll, we'll structure the transaction as follows, Calpers, to keep you happy. You bank at JP Morgan Chase, okay? And they bank with us. So what we'll do is we'll give our billion dollars in reserves to JP Morgan Chase, and now JP Morgan Chase has an imbalance on their balance sheet. They're plus $1 billion in reserves on the asset side. They need a liability for a billion dollars. And that's where you come in, CalPERS. What, will, what would Chase will do when we give the billion dollars to them is they will create an account for you in a billion for a billion dollars in bank money, which counts as a liability to Chase. It's an asset to you, but it's a liability to Chase. Now Chase's balance sheet balances out. And now you've got your billion dollars, Calpers, and you can take that money. You can go to the stock market. You can buy Tesla. That's a real high flying stock. And all you got to do to satisfy this transaction is send us the treasury. So it's a three way transaction. And okay. that's why you're seeing those two things locked. It's, a, it's like a three card money. It's a, it's wow. a three party transaction to make so, that happen. That's really interesting. Um, so BlackRock, I'm sure, is doing this out the wazoo right now. BlackRock told the Fed to do it. Yeah. On August 22nd of 2019, they had a plan at Jackson Hole. They called it going direct. They actually, they actually called it the next economic downturn. And they said, here's what you need to do when there's another downturn, Fed and other central banks. Next time there's a downturn, conventional monetary policy isn't going to work because we all know the interest rates are way too low. Can't lower them anymore. So what are we going to do? You need to find a way to get public money, meaning reserves, because it's created by an allegedly public entity created by the Fed, you need to find a way to get public money into private hands, meaning you need to find a way to get the blue line onto the red line and get John, them tracking each other. John, I'm just, you You explained this better than anyone I've ever seen. I watched tons of videos trying to understand this. You, to me, anyways, it just clicks right now. 
Good. You just explained this better than anyone I've ever seen. Well, Good. I can, I can, I can stop videos. working for the year. I've done my job. Because yeah, that's I mean, a really hard thing to understand. I had to beat my head against the table and against book after book after like, what's going on here? And the reason I would get confused is people like Bill, Bill Dudley come on and they start talking, well, reserves don't leak out. You're just a, you're just a hayseed, Titus, talking about reserves leaking out. And they're, yes. and they're right, but they're, they're telling you half truths. And finally, I figured it out. I was like, OK, yeah. I see John, to me, all this begs the question, who's really running who? Are the commercial banks running the Fed? Is the Fed running the commercial banks? Is it all just one team? <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's all one team. And I'll let John answer in a second. But what he just said at Jackson Hole, BlackRock came up with the idea, yeah, presented exactly. it to the central bankers. Exactly, and yeah. the central, I mean, come on, there's a revolving door right there, right? They, yeah. they, they, well, go, they go do a, two years, you know, first as, of all, Fed, as a they all, they all meet in Davos and come up with this. Yeah, yeah. They, do. they do. They meet around different places for sure. But let me, that's a great question. Because earlier I'd said the commercial banks lend first and they ask about reserves later, which kind of implies that the commercial banks are in the lead. And they were for a while. But let me tell you why the Fed is top dog, okay? Uh, aside from the fact that the Fed is the regulator of the commercial banks, okay? The Fed is top dog for another very important reason, which you need to understand, okay? The Fed can create as many reserves as they want. They could create four quadrillion reserves overnight with, with, with impunity, and there'd be no problem. Now, the Fed used to not be able to do that because there was a gold standard until 1971, and they couldn't, they had to watch how many reserves they created because you'd have people like France coming in going, oh yeah, $35 an ounce? Here, we got $35 million. Give us a million ounces in gold. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, boom, what happened? The gold window goes shut. That's what happened there. But after 1971, the Fed can create as many reserves as it want or as many Federal Reserve notes. So it can create as, many, as much money electronically or as much money physically as it wants to with complete impunity because nobody can come and redeem anything. If you, if you take a $100 bill to the Fed now, you're going to get 520s back, okay? <laughs> There's no way that Fed can be bankrupted now, okay? For commercial banks... They can create money out of thin air too, but they can be bankrupted. Okay, so let's say I walk into a commercial bank and get a loan for a million dollars, right? The, the, the commercial bank creates that million dollars out of thin air. So I've now got a million dollars in my account, which is a liability on the bank's balance sheet. And they've got a million dollar note that I signed saying I owe you a million dollars on the, on the asset side of their balance sheet. The, 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 but the bank is now exposed. Because if I turn around and say, hey, I want a million dollars in cash, the commercial bank can't print cash out of thin air. Fed prints cash, right? They got to come up with a million dollars. Or, or if I transfer it to another bank, let's say I transfer it to my credit union or whatever, the bank that just, just made the million dollar loan, they have to find a million dollars in reserves to satisfy the other bank because it is a liability. It, because it is an IOU for a million dollars, bank money is an IOU, no other bank is going to accept. I mean, are you going to accept your next door neighbor's IOUs? No, yeah. you're not going to take them on as your own. Banks aren't going to do that either. But the reason they do it is they know, yeah, we're going to take the, we're going to take the liability on because we're going to get an asset too to match it called, called reserves. And that's, mm -hmm. that's how that system works. But let's go back to your other point, which is ownership. You know, you can kind of figure out who owns, say, for example, J.P. Morgan Chase. You go to their website, you go to investor relations, you click on 10, 10K, you click on, you know, proxy statements, and you can see right there in the proxy statements, two biggest owners of J.P. Morgan Chase, BlackRock and Vanguard, 7% and 6%. It's right there in black and white. So you can see the companies own the world, don't they? Yeah, the companies that own the world, exactly. Mm -hmm. The question is, well, who owns, you know, like the New York Fed, who owns the Fed? And we don't know that. It's like Bank of America and uh, JP Morgan. Don't they own like 40 percent of it? I mean, it, they, I've seen numbers like that out there. Yes. Yes. They, they are the big because the way the regional Federal Reserves are set up is that the, the commercial banks in that circuit, say the New York circuit or San Francisco or Chicago, the regional Federal Reserves are owned by the member banks in that region. So in New York, it would be JP Morgan Chase, Citigroup, um, 
Uh, I think who else is in there? Bank of no, Bank of America, Charlotte, Wells yeah. Fargo, maybe. San, anyway, it's a bunch of bigger banks. But the New York Fed is also, you know, you know, Bank of New York Mellon, um, you know, banks like that. You don't really hear about so much. But they, yeah, they are owned by their member banks. The Federal Reserves are. So with this information in mind, and we're, we're talking about the um, the new central bank digital currencies. And those to me seem like it's it's a complete disintermediation or removal of the, the commercial banks from the system as, as what they're trying to get to. I mean, is that correct? Do you think it's for something else? Um, it's a good question. And let me answer it this way. I, CBDC, central bank digital currencies per se, will not, they don't eliminate banks, but the CBDC pathway doesn't have commercial banks in them. In other words, Central bank digital currencies are intended to be and are a liability of the Federal Reserve directly to ordinary people, ordinary businesses. So earlier when I said, you don't have a reserve account, I don't have a reserve account. Yeah, all of a sudden we're gonna have accounts at the Fed. That's central bank digital currency. Now the Fed already issues direct retail money. It's called cash, but it's in physical form and the Fed's not interested in that. And the central banks around the world are not interested in cash because they can't track it. You know, we, you had sent, you had Augustin Carstens, who's the general manager of the Bank for International Settlements, come out and say the problem with the hundred dollar bill. He says we don't know who has that money, we don't know what they're spending it on, we don't know what they're doing. Now, in all our analysis on CBDC, in particular for the use of general to the general use, uh, we tend to establish the equivalence with cash, uh, and there is a huge difference there. Uh, for example, in cash, uh, we don't know, for example, who is using a $100 bill today. We don't know who is using a 1,000 peso bill today. Uh, the, a key difference in, with the CBDC is that central bank will have absolute control on the rules and regulations that will determine the use of that uh, expression of central bank liability. And also, we will have the technology to enforce that. That is such a... Yeah, it's an eye-opener. I mean, I mean he's, a, he's making a statement there that sounds sort of uh, technocratic and a lot, probably just goes over a lot of people's heads. But if you, once you break that down, what that guy just said... It's one of the scariest clips of, I've ever watched. It's one of the... Yeah. And this is the guy in charge of the Bank of International Settlements. Right. Which... Just so for people who don't know, I've, I've heard it described before. That's the banker for the central banks or right. something like that. that they, these guys, or, this is the group that organize, organizes all the central banks together, correct? Correct. That the, the central bankers around the world can meet in Basel, Switzerland, where the BIS is headquartered, and they can meet secretly. And that's where they hatch their plans. And the BIS published papers that tell... You know, which direction we're going with things like central bank digital currency. And the guy you just saw, Augustin Carsons, is the head of the BIS. He's the general manager. And you're right. It was totally technocratic, like that expression of central bank liability. What he means is it's digital cash. We know where every penny is and we can yeah. control it. Every yeah. penny. I mean, basically, we're, we're gonna, someone we're, from a central bank following you around everywhere you go, knowing everything you do. It, it's just insanity. Right. And, and, Nick, and we, they can enforce the, he just said, they can make up their own rules and enforce them. So it's like, hey, yeah, man. forget about laws. Forget about laws of individual countries. That's now we're, we're the law. Yeah, the bank. It's like, you know, J.P. Morgan canceling uh, General Flynn's credit cards just recently. Right. I don't know if you saw Same that thing. story, but uh, it's like they said, "Oh, you're a reputational risk." Uh, we so they canceled. I mean, no one even knew that General Flynn had a credit card, but boom, boom, right. he's cut off from the reputational. System. This is coming from five-time felon J.P. Yeah, Morgan. Exactly, nine hundred twenty million dollar fine for criminal, you know, criminal, not you know, whatever for you crimes. Know. So, so, John, how how do we boil this down so it is easily understandable to the average person? Because I think that's the biggest part of the problem is that. They obfuscate everything with all these technical terms and ridiculous nonsense. You just keep hammering. You guys do yeah. a lot of good videos. Just keep hammering and hammering and hammering. Play their clips. Use their own words against them. That's what I try to do. What's the craziest thing is they're not hiding it. That You go to their website no. for the World Economic Forum. They tell you what they're going to do. Yeah. They announce it. And, yeah, here's and, but, but they just, here's they the just, rope we're going to hang you with. They, 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 just, great. they just know no one's, no one's, you know, or... 
Right. Only the crazies like us are really paying attention. Right. And, uh, and, and most people are, you know, they're more worried about, you know, what, what the Kardashians are doing than, than, uh, I don't know. Yeah. But you don't, you just need, you just need, you know, it's like Samuel Adams said during the revolution, it does not take a majority to prevail. It just takes an irate, tireless my, minority keen yeah. on setting brush fires in people's minds. And that's no. what you're doing. And that's what I'm doing. Just that keep was, on keeping on. That was it. The 5%. It was the 5% who basically started the American revolution. And the that's other 90, okay. the under 90% just, you know, went along. But it's, it's what it takes is, you know, us buying gold, us buying silver. And, and you know, this, I think that a lot of people, when the, the central digital bank currencies are coming, and we've talked with a lot of people about this, Bill Holter, is one example that Hop, I don't know if you've ever heard him speak. Sure. But his his thought is there's going to be a reset. It's going to, the first one's, he said there's going to be two resets. The first one's going to be man made. And w- when they try to do these central bank digital currencies, he thinks that's going to fail. And uh, then there's going to be a natural economic reset. And that one's going to be out of their control. Uh, that's his, that's his thesis that, you know, these central bank digital currencies, what, what Karstens is trying to do at the BIS, a lot of people are going to reject it and go to sort of a barter system. And there's yeah. some sort of alternative, either crypto, some sort of cryptocurrency, or um, there's things like Kinesis with a digital token that's backed by gold and silver, things like this. They're not solving any problem with central bank digital currencies if they can still keep keep creating an unlimited number of units, correct? We haven't, yes. let, we haven't solved the problem of leaving the gold standard with a central bank digital currency. Oh, absolutely not. The, the, because they can, again, they can create as much as they can create as much CBDC as they want, just as they can create as much reserves or as many FRNs as they, you know, Federal Reserve notes as they can. Yeah. To back up to something you said, it's not just a matter of buying gold and silver. What I like to see is people transacting in alternative currencies. Mm-hmm. And so when you see states like Ohio, for example, recently come out and abolish the sales tax, on gold and silver coins, mm-hmm. that's a great sign because that opens the gates to like, if it's if there's a sales tax on it, that means it's just a good. But if there's yeah. no sales tax on it, all of a sudden you can kind of, you don't have to worry about the sales tax and yeah. you can transact, you can buy and sell in, in, in coins like that. And that's great. Even, even in states that have sales tax, there's nothing stopping you from going, you know, to your barber and saying, hey, I'll give you a, right. you know, an ounce of silver for a haircut or whatever it may be. Right. You could do that now. I mean, and, and that, eventually that, you're going to have if, if you want, if you have one to preserve the option of converting that um, your metal into into the currency, you know, in the U.S. dollar, the sales taxes are going to get you no sales tax like Ohio is great. Yeah. You know, but you're exactly right. You can still transact for sure. Are you a, a gold and silver stacker yourself, John? I'm a big silver fan. I've, I'm, I'm a longtime fan of the the dimes and quarters half dollars and oh, dollars jug silver uh, yeah i'm like the 64 silver. coins yeah just because they're they're fungible they're recognizable they're part of our history and also you know there's a saying like you know a silver quarter has always been able to buy a gallon of gas you know i bought a gallon i bought gas today i got premium 375 a gallon it's like you know you look at you look at the melt value of a quarter it's like a little bit north of four Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's always true. It was true in 1964. It's true now, yeah, right? Yeah. I, I was talking to my friend yesterday, and we were talking about um, car prices in the early 70s, and we we're just trying to figure yeah. out like how much you could buy, you know, how much a car would cost today uh, in, in silver, and it it's pretty much the same because cars <laughs> were like seventeen hundred dollars, and we figured now yeah. cars, the equivalent car would be about forty thousand. And it's, it's funny you say that. I was a little kid in the early 70s, and I remember the first time. A car ad came on TV for a four thousand dollar car. I was like, "Wow, four thousand dollars!" You know, <laughs> you should get a car. good used car for four thousand dollars. Yeah, go go try to find one now. Yeah. You know, the used car prices are through the roof. So yeah, you know, that's the Fed. Oh, there's you know, there's no inflation. You know, we need more inflation. Are you are you insane? Yeah. Have you looked at the commodities chart recently? We, we, we follow more uh, John Williams for shadow stats for inflation data, yeah. you know, the, the 1980s standard. And uh, yeah. you know, that's another video. We'll, we'll have you back definitely to talk about some of these other topics because you've got a lot of great videos on your channel. You don't put out many videos, uh, you know, but no. when you do, they're, they're really good. And uh, well worth watching for sure. Well worth watching. Thank I'll put, you. I'll put the link in the description. 
Thank you very much, John. We'd love to talk to you again in the future. Yeah, and say hi to my friend Dave Kranzler. That's where I got my start making videos. Oh, really? Dave and I got together and we're making a bunch of videos. It was oh, great. Yeah, a lot of have, fun. We, we have Dave on regularly. Yeah, I know. All right. Thank you. All right, Thank you, guys. You.